Hello. Um, so my name is Lou and welcome to my little poetry breakdown. So today we're reading To Autumn by John Keats. Um, pretty short poem. Um, using Poetry Foundation. I think it's a really great resource if you're trying to uh, read poetry for personal reasons, school reasons, whatever it may be. Um, and they also have these uh, little annotations that pop up on some of them, which is pretty cool. Um, and then this, this has a poem guide. That's pretty nice. You can also look up poets, so pretty useful. Alrighty, let's get started. So first thing to know about John Keats is um, he died very young. He died, I believe, at the age of 25, right before he turned 26, like a few months before. Uh, he died of tuberculosis. Um, he lost a brother named Tom to tuberculosis uh, a few years beforehand. Um, there's a really great movie called Bright Star, which is actually the name of one of his poems uh, that you can watch for free on Netflix, I think right now if you have it or obviously it's not for free but you can watch it on Netflix um I really love it it's in my letterbox top four uh it's really great and it kind of like details the romance between him and Fanny Braun who was uh his his love interest um yeah so basically he had to go to Italy um because he couldn't withstand another winter uh in England because of his tuberculosis and he ended up dying there without actually being able to marry Fanny so it's pretty sad um and all this is good to remember uh it's also good to remember that John Keats is kind of an exception to a lot of the uh I guess rules that the romantic poets had set out before him um even those who kind of were operating at the same time like Shelley and Byron um I would say I notice a lot of similarities between him, Coleridge, and Wordsworth, um, just in the way that he describes things. But it's also good to remember that uh, at least one of my professors always says that he has a very, very uh, matured manner of writing. Um, he reached kind of like this poetic maturity before a ton of other poets ever could have wished to have reached it. So yeah, let's start with the first stanza of mists in mellow fruitfulness. Close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless, with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run, to bend with apples and the mossed cottage trees, and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core, to swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel to set budding more, and still more, later flowers for the bees, until they think warm days will never cease, for summer has o'erbrimmed their clammy cells. Okay, so this first stanza is obviously like absolutely gorgeous. Um, <clears throat> the natural imagery is, is beautiful, um, and you can definitely see just like his just insane ability to conjure up these scenes. Um, and I recently have just read uh, La Belle Dame Sans Merci and um, Ode to a Nightingale and Ode to Psyche. And I just, I was thinking this the whole time. Um, so we can sort of go line by line. So season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines and round the thatch eaves run. Um, so we kind of see, like, obviously this is uh, to autumn, so there's this, this intermingling of this, like, kind of phasing out of summer, um, and this, this coming up of, of uh, fall, which is really beautiful. To bend with apples the mossed cottage trees and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core. To swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells. Gourd and hazel shells I obviously associate with autumn, so that would make sense with a sweet kernel to set budding more, and still more, later flowers for the bees, until they think warm days will never cease, for summer has o'erbrimmed their clammy cells. So I, I think it's interesting that the bees kind of take on this, um, this, they're kind of like a character within this, it's just really nice. Um, yeah, I don't really have too much to say because I think it's just a really nice depiction of this kind of late 
August, early September, or even you could say like mid-September, um, where summer is phasing out, you know, you can feel fall coming in. Um, but it's not it's not quite there yet. Let's go to the second stanza stanza. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind, or on a half-reaped furrow sound asleep, drowsed with the fume of poppies, while thy hook spares the next swath, <clears throat> excuse me, and all its twined flowers, and sometimes like a gleaner, thou dost keep steady thy leaden. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind, or of a half reaped furrow sound asleep, drowsed with the fume of poppies, while thy hook spares the next swath and all its twined flowers. And sometimes like a gleaner thou dost keep, steady thy laden head across a brook, or a cider press with patient look, thou watchest the last oozing hours by hours. So this obviously, Autumn kind of takes on a more, like kind of a character role like the bees do. It's obviously this whole poem is addressed to Autumn, but it feels more here that Autumn is a character. So I love the, the use of questioning. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor. So it's, it's, it's addressing Autumn, obviously, but I also think it gives Autumn this personality. Like when you, when you go abroad, Autumn isn't as um, intense. Winnowing, separating the wheat from the chaff, the heavy from the light. Thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind. Winnowing, obviously the separating of the wheat um, feels it's very autumnal. Or on a half reaped furrow sound asleep. Drows with the fume of poppies with thy hook. Uh, so we have a scythe here, um, which I'm, I think is also very autumnal. Um, this kind of, this symbol of the harvest. Um, I also think drows with the fume of poppies is a really interesting line. Again, it, it kind of gives like a, a sort of otherworldly quality to autumn, which I think is obviously very indicative of romantic styles. Um, it also reminds me a lot of uh, Ode to Nightingale, where, um, you know, there's this substance use or use, desire to use substances, and I, I think of poppies and fume of poppies, especially here. Spares the next swath and all its twined flowers, and sometimes like a gleaner thou dost keep. Gleaner, one who gathers the remaining food after the reaper has harvested the field. Again, harvest. Steady thy laden, loaded down, head across a brook. Or by a cider press with patient look, thou watchest the last oozings hours by hours. So again, this cider press, you like it very much autumnal, you, you know, like having apple cider. Um, study thy laden head across a brook. Yeah, it's just, it's gorgeous. And I don't have too much to say because it really is just an ode to autumn. And if I were smarter, maybe I could come up with something that's more profound. But I just think it's a beautiful depiction of you know, we have here this kind of summary, um, summary energy that autumn takes on in the early stages. And then here, you know, it's kind of within autumn and you're in the full swing of things. <clears throat> this beautiful wind, um, you're sitting and watching the harvest, kind of feeling the fumes of the poppies hit you. Maybe you're feeling a little disoriented. Um, and then the, the cider press, you're waiting for your apple cider. It's just gorgeous. Let's go to the third stanza. Where are the songs of spring? I, where are they? Think not of them, thou hast thy music too. While bared clouds bloom the soft dying day and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue. Then in a wailful choir, the small gnats mourn among the river sallows, borne aloft or sinking as the light wind lives or dies. And full grown lambs loud bleat from hilly born. Hedge crickets sing, and now with tremble soft, the red breast whistles from a garden croft, and gathering swallows twitter in the sky. So first thing I noticed here immediately is the gathering swallows twitter in the sky. Um, obviously we see a lot of bird imagery in romantic poetry, and it typically means life. 
So in my mind, this is especially in con uh, conjunction with this line, this is very much entering more to, to, uh, to spring, um, which is interesting because it feels like there's a complete skip of winter. So maybe that's just something that we don't want <laughs> to talk about. Or um, it's Keats kind of saying that, you know, autumn is a, is a bit of everything, which I think is pretty accurate. Um, I love fall. It's my favorite season. And I definitely see um, this kind of uh, amalgamation of all the different seasons in one. So where are they? Uh, this is like, talking about a rhetorical convention, often appearing in poems that meditate on transitional nature of life and inevitability of death. Yep, that definitely see that, um, especially with maybe entering uh winter and that's the death we're talking about where the songs of spring uh to color with a soft warm tint or glow um fields made up of stubble the remaining stumps of grain left after reaping yep so this is this again is a, this progression of time um maybe the poet or maybe the speaker excuse me was kind of wishing for spring you know we're in we're transitioning into winter Willow trees among the river and then garden croft. Let's see, a croft in a small enclosed field. So let's go about line by line. Where are the songs of spring, eh? Where are they? Think not of them, thou hast thy music too. So um, it's interesting that we're comparing spring to autumn. It's almost like the speaker is like convincing autumn or maybe convincing the reader even that uh, autumn is beautiful too. Autumn has its, its place in the world. While barred clouds bloom the soft dying day and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue. I think this image of the fields kind of left after a, the reaping or left after the harvest, but being um, kind of uh, juxtaposed next to the soft dying day with a rosy hue is so autumnal. Like you, you can see, like I was saying before, the, the shift from autumn to winter but you still have that like residual uh, effects of summer or even like the, um, the beauty of spring kind of cropping up in the sky, it's just so pretty. I actually have a picture, a Polaroid of um, something exactly like this. The wailful choir, the small gnats mourn among the river sallows borne aloft or sinking as the light wind lives or dies. So this is, this is really interesting. Then in a wailful choir, the small gnats mourn. Um, I think this definitely is, um, is hinting at the death of summer. Small gnats, you don't necessarily see them once the wind, uh, the, the fall comes around, especially the colder weather of fall. And among the river sallows, borne aloft or sinking as the night wind lives or dies. Um, yeah, I quite frankly do not entirely know what to make of this. Um, I think, well, now that I'm thinking about it, um, that this is just another uh, aspect of the, the gnats kind of dying. Um, I didn't connect the two at first. Um, and full-grown lambs loud bleat for hilly born, hedge crickets sing, and now with treble soft, the red breast whistles from a garden croft. Again, another, another bird. Um, I also think lamb is a really, really interesting uh, animal to have here. Because um, typically when I think of lambs, I think of spring. But um, the lamb is full grown now. So maybe this is a lamb that, uh, it, that kind of has grown up. They were born last spring. But the lamb is still called a lamb, which you would normally call like a full grown animal, a sheep. So it's, it's kind of interesting that he chose lamb here. Maybe it's... Um, Kind of hinting at this uh this middle ground between spring and fall um hedge crickets sing i think this imagery of hedge that kind of crops up or pops up in a bunch of different romantic poetry is really great um and now with treble soft the red breast whistles from a garden croft um yeah i don't have much to say just really beautiful again that hinting of life so overall, I would say that this poem is just gorgeous. Um, I could imagine myself writing something um, that is intensely less eloquent <laughs> than this while sitting in a field, um, maybe after I've picked some apples and had some apple cider, feeling that, uh, that um, 
winnowing wind that Keats is talking about. Um, yeah, so thank you for looking at this with me, and I will see you later.